it got mixed around on me. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Samuelson, for setting this up and everyone else for your interest in this important topic. Uh, I, I work in Harrisburg on the Appropriations Committee and I primarily handle education issues. And today, you know, I know people have a different uh, starting point with understanding this issue. So I'll try and uh, give us some background and then open it up for discussion. So hopefully I can go through this in, in 15, 20 minutes and then we can hear your perspectives and feedback. And I wanna start super basically, you know, in our United States system, our federalist system, the education is responsibility of the state. So every state in their state constitution is gonna have something that, that spells out the responsibility. And in Pennsylvania, you're probably familiar with ours. It says, you know, the General Assembly must provide a thorough and efficient system. And so that's where you start at. It's a state responsibility to, to fund education, even though there are some limited federal funds that come in. So we look at how Pennsylvania is doing relative to its peers. We are 44th, seventh worst in the nation in terms of this, the share that the state kicks in, uh, 38%. And that's in aggregate. We have a range within our state. Uh, for example, the state that gets the, the school district that gets the least is Upper Marion School District in Montgomery, only gets 15% of their funding from the state. Duquesne in Allegheny County, on the other hand, gets 85% of their funding from the state. But in aggregate, only 38% of the funds come from the state. And for a school district like Bethlehem, only 27% of the funds come from the state. And that has a big impact. When you, when you leave locals up to their own devices to pay for it, and you have vast inequities in what locals can generate, you have differences in outcomes. So here is another chart comparing Pennsylvania to our, our peers, our other states. And Indiana is doing it right. They're spending more on their poorest students and their, and their poorest districts because the research shows those, school to, those students need the most resources to meet the academic standards. So this is what makes sense based on the research. More money needs to go be targeted to these sort of districts. Pennsylvania, we're the worst. Our, our inequities between our rich and poor school districts our poor school districts, when you look at the combination of state and local funds, get 33% less per student than the wealthier schools. And I mean, just look at the drastic difference in that line for Pennsylvania. These are some factors in the fair funding formula. And you know, they're a little bit wonky, at, so I apologize, but I think it really helps when you look at the local areas. Student of color share of enrollment, pretty self-explanatory. The green is the percentage of students in poverty. The statewide median is 13.4%. This local tax capacity is an element of the fair funding formula. And what it does is it says, it looks at what every school district taxes and it takes the median tax rate. And then it applies that rate statewide and asks if every school district tax at this rate how much would each school district generate in funds? So the median school district would generate $7,700. The local tax effort, effort could mean burden. It just, I just pulled out the percentile. The higher it is, the higher your tax burden, the stronger effort your local community is making. And then here's the, the end result. How much are you able to spend per student? And I, I picked out a few neighboring districts across the state and in your region, and then I'll do Northampton County next. But the, the easiest punching bag is the Philadelphia and Lower Marion. They share a border. Uh, Philadelphia has extremely high poverty. And when you look at what they could raise if they tax at the same rate, Philadelphia $5,500 per student, Lower Marion more than 32000 Lower Marion, to their credit, they have a high tax effort. They're, they pay for it to enjoy this high level of spending. Philadelphia is still taxing well above the median, but when this is what you can generate, it trickles down to what you can spend because you know, it goes back to the problem that the state's not doing enough to level the playing field. So they're, they're left to their own devices. You can go to almost every county in the state and 
find the area where there's a pocket of poverty and look right next to it and you'll just see these inequities. Reading is one of our worst tax bases in the state. They can only raise 1,300 per student when taxing at the same rate as their neighbor, Wilson, uh, they get 10,000 and it, it shows up in what they can spend per student. Allentown and their neighbor Parkland, again, Allentown has uh, much higher poverty. And you can see the, the student of color breakdowns as well. Uh, they just, they can't generate the money locally, even though Allentown is in the 90th percentile in terms of the effort they're making. You know, they're taxing their constituents a lot, uh, but they're, they're not able to spend a lot because the state's not leveling the playing field. Now, I, I won't keep going down, but I could go to every county in the state and pull those numbers. And I'll, I'll back up because Monroe is interesting because, you know, they're not as bad as the Reading and Allen towns, but they have some of the highest tax effort in the state. And that's where you hear about the property tax complaints a lot. Um, but they do enjoy uh, relatively high spending per student, but they're, if, I have an emergency, if they want that, they have to pay for it and tax themselves a lot for it. Now, some observations when I was looking at Northampton County, um, I pulled in a couple more data points. Obviously, Bethlehem is the largest school district by quite a lot. They have the highest share of students of color. Your entire county, I was surprised at how, you know, it's more uniform than other counties. Um, every, every district is above the, the median in income. Um, you, you're on both sides of the, the median in terms of poverty, Bethlehem has the highest. Uh, you do, you're able to raise more funds generally than the, the median school district when taxing yourself. But um, what jumps out is you, you guys are a high tax effort county. You, uh, you tax yourselves a lot and therefore, you know, some get toward the upper end of the spending per student uh, distribution where others, even though you get this high tax effort, Bethlehem's not able to spend more than, than the median district. And this looks at weighted student, and I'll get more to that in a second, but it's a more apples to apples comparison. So just to recap the first problem, the state's not kicking in enough money, we're leaving it up to the locals, and they have vastly different abilities to raise money and pay for education. And you can see that in the outcomes and graduation rates, achievement gaps, by socioeconomic status, by race, et cetera. The second problem is the money we do provide. Are we distributing that equitably? And, you know, in our state, one third of our budget is the pre-K to 12 education piece. So it is a sizable part of our state budget. But within that one third, there, there are many funding streams. We provide an appropriation specifically for special education, for pre-K and early intervention, school employee social security, pupil transportation, career and tech ed, food services, PCERS, all these things. But what gets the most attention is the basic ed, the basic education funding. This is the general support to school districts and it's half the funds we send them. So it rightfully gets a lot of attention. And when we talk about how the fair funding formula is distributed, we're talking about this part of the pie, the biggest chunk, the general support. So, you know, the second problem is yes, the pie is too small, but the, the existing pie is also not distributed fairly. And it took decades to get to that problem. So I wanna rewind and walk us through how we got here and Representative Samuelson mentioned it. The policy is called hold harmless, not really a policy, it's more of a practice. And if history wasn't written by the winners, we'd call it hold harmed because that's how it really shows up for a lot of school districts. And I just took snap snapshots of, of the law just to show you what hold harmed does. It, it's, it's a sentence in there. And this is the 1996, 97 school year. And it says for that school year, the Commonwealth shall pay to each school district basic ed funding, again, that, that big chunk, which shall consist of the following, an amount equal to the basic ed funding allocation for the 95-96 school year, so that's the previous year, and then two plus a base supplement 
payable to qualifying school districts, and then it would go on to list a formula. So what it's saying is you get what you got last year, plus we're going to divvy up the new money. Maybe the legislature added $100 million that year, and they, they put some factors in place to divvy it up. The very next year, again, it shows up. What do you get for 97, 98? Well, first we're gonna give you exactly what you got last year. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna distribute the new money, the margins again. So everybody gets an increase and you, you get your previous money locked in. And you know, by with doing that one year is, is not so much of a problem. When you do that for 25 years, that's how the, the problem blows up. And this is a good chart from PCCY, they, they just took the enrollment change over when Hold Harm started in 1992 to you know, a couple of years ago. And you can see it in the rural parts of the state, many school districts had upwards of 25% reduction in their enrollments. And when you, when you get at least what you got last year and your number of students is declining, the amount you're getting per student from the state uh, grows so that that creates this disparity in, in state funding. And when you lost 25% of your population, that's how you see some school districts getting way more than their fair share because we never changed the formula to reflect the changing demographics of their area. And it was even a little bit worse. There were some years where we provided guaranteed minimum increases, even in the 80s and 90s. But it was 92 when the current cold harmed practice started and then for decades, we, we just sort of made up a formula each year. It was difficult for school districts to budget because not only don't they know how much will, they'll be, they don't know what formula the state will use to distribute it. Under Rendell, we had something called an adequacy formula for a few short years that um, got tangled up with the Great Recession and the federal funding. And when Republican Governor Corbett came in the office, he he switched gears and, and went back to a different ad hoc formula and hold harmless um, with politically influenced dollars going around. But I want to take a second and talk about the difference between fair and adequate. What the fair formula does is it divides up that basic education piece that the state provides. It doesn't ask how big it is. It doesn't matter. It says, you know, Bethlehem School District's fair share is 0.86%. Out of the 500 school districts, it gets 0.86%. The size of the pie could be a personal pan pizza or one of these big Texas pizzas. It doesn't matter. It just divvies up the pie fairly. Whereas what we had for a few brief years under Governor Rendell, we said, well, what does it actually cost to educate a student? How much should the state be kicking in and how much should the local be kicking in and it it figured out how much was missing and statewide it was it was four and a half billion dollars i think and it put us on a track to to get up to meet those targets by asking locals to kick in where necessary and the state was pumping money in but again we we abandoned this approach and we're, we're back to something that looks like this it just divides up the pie and so one of the problems is, and you'll hear advocates say, we need to get back to asking, what does it actually cost? What do districts need? And use metrics to determine that. Um, they prefer the adequacy approach rather than uh, a fair formula approach. But I know this is a, a ton of data, but this is what the fair formula looks like for Bethlehem. It starts with the, the number of students they have, and it adds students based on weights for poverty, et cetera. And then it takes district factors like the median household income, the local effort and local capacity that we talked about and gets a new total of students. And you divide that by the state total and you get Bethlehem's fair share of funding. That's the 0.86 that I talked about. So that basic ed funding commission in 2014 said, stop using ad hoc formulas we looked at the research, we looked at what other states do. These metrics make sense. This is how we should distribute funds. And then they said, well, what would happen if we put the whole pot through this formula? And you know, this is in 1415, but this is in 2020. It would cause seismic shifts in our funding. 
Um, in, 14, in 2014, it would have caused a $1 billion shift out of $6 billion of funds from 320 school districts getting more than their fair share to 180 school districts getting less than their fair share. So in, in 2021, the current year, if we had applied the formula to all funding, um, well, because we don't, Bethlehem misses out on almost $20 million, mm -hmm. which is 37% of their state funds. That's um, almost 1,300 per student. That's the ninth percentile most inequitable in the state. So you're, you're up there with districts like Norristown that Representative Bradford has. Um, and it would be a 7% increase in your, in your total revenues. But of course, there's a flip side of that. That money comes from other districts. They're, they're getting pitted against each other in this scenario. And, and some districts would lose, you know, 20% of their budget, 10% of their budget, which is uh, really hard to do to a community in a single year. So the, the commission didn't tell the General Assembly how to deal with this problem. They said, here's the formula you should use. Um, definitely get rid of hold harmless, but you guys figure out how to do it, deal with the inequities on your own. And so I just want to capture the law again. We, we got rid of hold harmless. We said for the 15, 16 year and each year thereafter. So we put the formula in place that so you had more predictable format for schools. You, they knew what metrics we'd be using to give them money. Um, but the base amount stayed at 13, 14 into the future. So like Representative Samuelson said, it only applies to new money. So we locked in those inequities as of 2014 and we did the, the new money going forward. And this is just a visual representation of that. As we add to that basic education funding line item, you know, the green bar goes up and the fair share of funds goes up, but we're really not attacking these historical inequities at all. We're just nibbling around the edge, which is causing a lot of the frustrations around the state and in your community. To his credit, this year, Governor Wolf came out with a really bold proposal. He says he's gonna flip the script. He wants to put all the money through the formula and then he's gonna add a billion dollars to make sure nobody loses any funds. And this would have drastic impacts. Um, Bethlehem School District would get a $25 million increase from the state. It'd be a 74% increase in funds if his proposal was enacted. Everybody, everybody would get some um, because he's holding everyone harmless to last year and pumping money through the formula and even giving everybody a little bit uh, but it would be transformational for, for a number of school districts. Allentown, not Allentown, Bethlehem falls in this, this range. And one of the 54 school districts that would get between 50 and 100% more funding. And it would really help the racial inequities we see in our state. And I apologize, this chart takes a minute to digest too, but uh, the left two bars are Pitts Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And what um, I've done is I've taken our 500 school districts and condensed them into five. And I picked the five based on lining them up based on their share of students of color. And each of these school districts has an equal population. So if you look at our school district with the most students of color um, in 2014, in 2015, 16, they were getting $1,700 less than their fair share while the the school district with the, the highest share of white students was getting $2,000 more than their fair share. And after five years of the fair funding formula, it actually got, it got worse. We're just applying money, new money. You know, the poverty is still there, the historical inequities are still there. Um, so it's clear that this approach isn't working, or at least it's clear to many of the, the Democrats or people who represent these areas. And what Wolf proposal does is it actually would really move the equity needle. It would, it would cut these inequities almost in half by uh, flipping the script and, and pushing all the money through the formula while recognizing the political reality that it, you can't cut school districts and get something passed in Harrisburg. So it, um, it really... It, I'm sorry, it, Joe Roy, I'm the superintendent of Bethlehem. I just wanted to 
reinforce this for a second for particularly for Mrs. Lee to make sure that um, we're clear on it, right? So this is showing that the, the um, most overfunded districts are the whitest districts and yes. the most underfunded are have the largest share of students of color. So that's the red and the blue parts there. And that's, it's not just um, poverty. Um, it's not just the value of the uh, real estate in a district. There's clear connections. Um, there's there's clear divisions by race, and I think that's that's a critical piece. That's, by the way, that's this what is, I'm saying. That's what this I'm is saying. fantastic, Sean. Um, I've seen yes. these numbers lots of times, and the, the, I'm loving this presentation. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, and, and thank thanks, you, Dr. For... Boy. I I see that as well. Yeah. And, and thanks for highlighting that because it, it really is a point we've been trying to make and it's something that frustratingly the some of the Republicans on the other side refuse to even acknowledge even though it's it's right here in, in the numbers. So so far I've sort of walked us through the problems. The pie is too small. We're, we're, we're making people rely on their own local resources. The existing pie is not divided fairly. Um, because of historical problems of guaranteeing at least what you got last year. And then there's some people who say that the platform we're using altogether is wrong. We should be asking what districts need rather than um, what the state can afford. And there are a number of proposals that, that take aim at this problem. I, I touched on Governor Wolf. I believe Representative Rav from Philadelphia is eventually going to be introducing it, but this would be his proposal to, you know, inject $1.3 billion into the funding, um, make sure nobody loses any money, give school districts like Bethlehem a huge increases, finally getting close to their fair share of the funds. And there are other options out there. Senator uh, Boscola wants to phase out hold harm to over four years. So, 25% um, of the funds go through the formula in year one, 50, 75, 100, and then all the money's fair. The, the tricky thing with proposals like this is, as districts like, if you're not growing the pie, the money's coming from other districts in the state, and those other districts represent other votes in Harrisburg, and people uh, really don't like taking money away from their district. Representative Sterla uh, from Lancaster and Representative Mullins, they sort of and their proposals recognize that it's going to be tough to take money away. So they're looking ahead and saying, you know, we have this imbalance from the past and we've been giving funds out fairly. Well, why don't we start giving funds to counteract that imbalance? So they, they accelerate funding to those who aren't getting their fair share. So Representative Sterler says the first $150 million we add every year is only going to go to those who get fair share until they're caught up. Representative Mullins, it's the same idea, except he doesn't put a dollar, he puts a percentage. 75% of whatever we add goes to catch people up first, and then 25% goes to everybody until we're all caught up. Representative Sloshberg, and this is, uh, you likely heard from many groups, got behind this proposal, and he's the one who introduced it. It's called the Level Up Supplement. It doesn't exactly look at the fair funding formula, it just looks at what districts are spending per student in poverty. And it takes the, the schools that spend the, the 100 school districts that spend the least, and it, it gives them a supplemental payment to try and, it's really targeting money to school districts educating the most low income students who have the lowest spending. Um, so it, it's more of a blend of fairness and adequacy than it is something like these other ones that, that targets the historical inequities specifically in basic ed. And even some uh, Republicans have bills. Representative Stevens, he does 100% fair immediately. Again, that, that would cause a $1 billion shift from some school districts to other ones. And Representative Gillespie wants to even enshrine it in our constitution to say, let's not make this mistake ever again, how we got here um, and ban hold harmed that way. Can I ask a question? This is Esther Lee. How does, with, with the formula, how does the charter schools uh, 
figure into this formula, you know, in taking away and, 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 and giving to others, uh, where do they fit into this formula? That's a, it's a really good question. And, and charter school funding would be a whole other a presentation, but there's this term in the, the formula called average daily membership. And it's different from enrollment because average daily membership counts all the, all the students in the school district who the school district is financially responsible for, which includes students who attend charter schools who live in the district. So when the charter schools get paid by the school district, not from the state. So the way um, we reimburse, problem. that is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but so we pay school districts for every student that lives in their boundary and then yeah. school districts turn around and pay the charter schools. Yeah. There is a charter school weight in here that recognizes that even though a student leaves, there are stranded costs in the classroom. Um, but it's, it's minuscule and it, it doesn't, it doesn't cover the growing costs. And there, there used to be a separate appropriation where the state would help defer the costs for charter schools, but that was eliminated by Governor Corbett in 2011, and it, it never made its way back. But I think, I think that, you know, somewhere legislative, legislative uh, persons have to look at and then be more inclusive and considerate of this charter school uh, education versus public education and, and how it's deterring the progression of funds into our public school treasuries for the education of our black and brown, brown students. You know, we can call them poverty all we want, you know, but I think we're not looking at the fairness is coming into the fact of where we're positioning the money. Yeah, I think the top two issues that we hear in Harrisburg are equitable funding and charter school funding. And, you know, I think this next thing will, will kind of illustrate why we haven't seen more movement on these sort of things. And it comes with a dis disclaimer. This is <laughs> something I, I did sitting here one afternoon last session. So it's a little bit out of date. But I went, I went member, I created a spreadsheet with all the members. Mm -hmm. And I said, who would vote for something that had the concept of providing more uh, more funding through the fair funding formula, trying to get toward equity. How, how would the vote break out? And I, I made the imperfect assumption that each member would vote based on the interests of the school district that represents the largest share of their constituents. So Representative Samuelson's easy to figure out his vote because he has one school district, but there, there are some members with uh, 10 and even 12 school districts. It's really hard to say how they would vote. Um, so this is just purely for illustrative purposes to kind of get a, a sense of where things are. And again, this is last session. In the House, Republicans have a majority of the members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, when I did this with this assumption, I got 54% of, of the PA House would vote to make funding more equitable based on these interests. But the problem you run into is most of those votes are Democratic votes. And most of the no votes are the, the majority, which controls the agenda and will likely never let something like that even come to the point where you're voting on it. So that's where a lot of the, the frustration of these, these bills I just talked about, um, sometimes they get a hearing, but usually they just languish in committee because um, the, the deciding control doesn't, doesn't want to create a vote like this that would turn people against each other. The majority leader would say, um, would listen to that 61 to 39 against within his own caucus. Exactly. So <laughs> lastly, uh, because it always comes up as a question, uh, the school funding lawsuit has been working its way through Pennsylvania for a number of years. Uh, the group leading that charge is the Public Interest Law Center. They've got a great website. They've got a ton of information on it. I stole some of their charts for this presentation. And if you want to build more uh, community support, they have a great presentation that they take on the road to communities. And we'll, we'll talk to an audience 
um, full of people about this issue. It, it takes them like an hour and a half, but it, it's thorough, uh, comprehensive, and it, it, it helps get the message out to communities, get more people asking for change. But basically what they're saying is our con we're not meeting our constitutional obligation that I started with for every student. Right. There are clear uh, racial disparities, income disparities in uh, how much student, how many resources students have. So what they're asking the court to do is declare it unconstitutional. And they want the court to say that the General Assembly and the administration have to work together to find something that doesn't discriminate against students. And that will be in front of the Commonwealth Court in September. And that's one step below the state Supreme Court, which would have final say if it gets appealed to that level. So that, that you could hear a decision as quickly as um, late 2022, not that it's been quick, but I think the Commonwealth Court exercise will take a couple months and then it, it would go to the Supreme Court likely. Thank you. That, that's the conclusion of what I prepared and I wanna thank Representative Samuelson and you all again and we'll be here for questions and, and dialogue.